Well, in this uh, lecture, I'm going to um, recap a little bit of where we've been and where we're coming from. Uh, and there are some things that uh, I would like to, I think, are worth reinforcing. And so I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on them. Remember the first lecture we began with key bending demonstration. Key got bent, uh, psychically, of course. And um, uh, we had people write down their, what they could see, what they witnessed, and then their best guesses as to what happened. And this I've done several other times as well as demonstration over, over a period of at least 30 something years for lawyers, for uh, undergraduates at the University of Oregon, but also elsewhere. And it's quite consistent what the results have been. Uh, most of the people, almost no one, writes an adequate description because it's too much to, you don't know in advance what to, what to put in there. And if you don't know what, advan what, and that's the point, if you don't know what to be, you're supposed to be looking for, you're not gonna get good information. And this is the problem of eyewitness testimony. It's a problem of observation. And one of the things when we talk about how to think about dubious claims, it's important that you should not waste your thinking on useless information. And much of the information that's going to be supplied to you for you to evaluate a claim is going to be useless. And that's why we focus on the need for replication, but also the need for observation, which is pro prospective rather than retrospective. So most of the cases that happen, people see miracles and stuff like that, but it's, they weren't planning to look for it. They didn't have a systematic plan of what they were supposed to be looking for. And scientific information, by the way, it's only the last 400 years or so that we do have something called scientific method. Uh, so it's a very recent thing, and it's not something that's compatible for most people's way of looking at the world. Uh, indeed, uh, Last time I gave, I gave a uh, university, the state of Oregon hired me to give a workshop some years ago to uh, many of the people who run institutes uh, for rehabilitating people from drugs or other things. There are a lot of these uh, facilities throughout the state. And the state had passed a law that the techniques that people use in such facilities should be evidence-based. And this had created a tremendous backlash, a few because none of these people knew, had any idea what evidence space meant. So I had to run a workshop to teach him this. And I was evaluated by the people who took the workshop, and one person said I was great. Everyone else said I was the worst <laughs> person you could have. And they, they, they pointed out the reason for it was that I wasn't tolerating other ways of knowing. I was, I was emphasizing that if you're going to really know something, you've got to get good data. Garbage in, garbage out, right? And they felt that they knew without having to have that kind of information. There were other ways of knowing, and I didn't, wasn't tolerant of other ways of knowing. And um, so it's not uh, that the use of good information uh, it's, it's hard to, it's not, not something built into us. Even the use of science, where you have the luxury of ahead of time planning for observations, planning to make the observation of the conditions where you have calibrated your instruments, you have a standardized procedure, you know what to look for and what, what you can ignore and so on. This is what science is all about and this is how you get trustworthy data. And, if it's, and, the, and the more you deviate from that plan, the less trustworthy the data is. And that's the whole problem of eyewitness testimony. So we focused on that, and we had some examples which try to uh, give you some feeling about the reasons why we need to have trustworthy data. And uh, uh, we talked about why smart people can be so stupid. And uh, in that, we, uh, I short-circuited some of the things that I, I think I should elaborate on a little bit more. We talked about intelligence, and intelligence testing and so on. And I told you about one book which I recommended by Keith Stanovich called What the Intelligence Test What the Intelligence Test 
miss, basically. And there are other people who realize that, that intelligence tests uh, are not very good predictors of a lot of real world phenomena. And there's different reasons why that's so. Intelligence testing, by the way, it's a, a long established tradition and the research and science that goes into it is pretty, st pretty uh, strong. And uh, eventually most people who study intelligence divide into two kinds of intelligence. There's what they call crystallized intelligence and uh, fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is, uh, if you take an intelligence test, you're asked things about facts, you know, uh, knowing uh, certain um, uh, pieces of information about the world. This is something you accumulate. It's not innate or anything. You learn it. But the intelligence test is testing you to see how much you have learned uh, that people, ordinary people ought to know. That was the idea. Uh, but the other kind of intelligence, the uh, fluid intelligence, is, is being able to deal with new information and new problems. It's more like a, lot, a way of to what extent you can handle logical thinking and tricky types of thinking. And uh, intelligence tests measure that as well. Now, how is it that being intelligent, though, turns out to be a very poor predictor of whether you're going to be sensible, whether you're going to be taken in or not taken in, so on. And it turns out to be a bad, bad predictor of that. And being intelligent, as we demonstrated in one, at least one case, and uh, we'll talk about some other cases like that, very intelligent, competent people have acted in very, very stupid ways. Now, I know stupid is a term of, it's a pejorative term, but let's face it. Stupidity is stupidity. <laughs> um, and I don't mean to down, downplay them, but I don't think that we should encourage stupidity. So uh, I don't think we have to be nice about it either. The pro problem is, and the way I look at it, that people talk, have different notions about why intelligence isn't a good predictor of smartness, basically. And it's not a good predictor because uh, it's, it's a, it does predict a little bit, but not strongly. It's not a good predictor because it's a measure of what I would call capacity. And, and s s there are two kinds of tests, that, that uh, psychological tests. There are those tests, what I would call measures of capacity, what you tend to under ideal conditions. Uh, aptitude tests, intelligence tests belong in that category. However, they don't, but the fact that you have this high capacity doesn't mean you're going to use it intelligently. I mean, you're going to, you're going to apply it rashly. And so there's a distinction being made between rationality and intelligence. Most people have sufficient, uh, not all, but most people have sufficient intelligence to, uh, to be able to handle almost anything if they really want to have the right attitude, if they don't have the disposition. So, most of what we call rationality is more of what we call a cognitive disposition. It's, it's a desire, a want to get to the truth, a, a desire to really look at the problem at, and, and figure things out, to get the right answer. And it turns out a lot of intelligent people, we have, um, it, that's not my phone. No, <laughs> Okay. Uh, it turns out that um, uh, the, uh, I sort of lost my train of thought because uh, this is why we ask people to turn their phones off before we begin these things. Uh, okay, uh, where was I? I was. Talking about uh, desire to get to the truth. Yes, okay. Uh, and it turns out that. Uh, even when I was first beginning running my Skeptics Toolbox, which I began in 1992 in Eugene, Oregon, I run it every summer. We have this thing called Skeptics Toolbox, where the idea is to teach people how to be nice skeptics. Uh, a, a sort of a um, mismanners of skepticism, okay. <laughs> uh, among other things. Uh, even uh, when I began running that, some of the people who come to that workshop had no desire to think 
what we call rationally. They were more interested in what we call confirmation bias. They wanted to have, have, a, have look for information, things that would fulfill their prior beliefs. And when you have that kind of an attitude, you're consumed by that, you're not applying your intelligence in the rational way. And uh, as you know, lots of people for various reasons, there are people out there on the street corner, and we, we saw yesterday, who are asking you to believe, be saved, with, and, and it's somehow there's a value to them of not having good information or not uh, having a, a scientific approach to this thing. There's, uh, to believe in faith is somehow a value to them. And if you have such values, all the intelligence in the world is not going to do you much good, right? Um, so, this is some of the things we went through. Uh, now I want to review also, I didn't review as much as I can, we used a few problems to uh, get across uh, some of the aspects of why it is that rational, intelligent people uh, can go astray. And one of the taxonomies I gave you, so let me uh, show you that again was a one, the several people with five taxonomies. This is one by uh, Keith Stan, uh, Stanovich, I think in one of his books, he's written about four or five books. Can you make that clearer? Try to get on. I'll go through it though a little bit. I didn't go through it as much as I should, but I gave you problems, examples. You remember one problem I gave you was the um, uh, Jack, Anne and um, George. You remember the names, okay. Uh, the, the problem was that, uh, I have it here? Yeah, okay. I'll take it out of this thing here. Here it is right here. Uh, I don't know if you can, I'll read it for you. Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? Well, some of you were here and now know the answer. Some of you weren't here, may or may not know the answer. And we're given, we're given this is very important, you're given three alternatives. A, yes, B, no, and C cannot be uh, decided and determined. And almost everyone here picked C. And I would guess most of you would pick C too. Uh, only because I know that you have minds that work like mine, which is not too good, okay? Uh, now, if you don't, so you weren't here, uh, that this is a difficult problem because uh, it violates the principle of the cognitive miser. The idea of the cognitive miser is one of the reasons why one of the taxonomies that um, Goes this way, okay. Uh, if you notice this, this flow diagram, so on the very left there are two right here and here. These are the two basic overall categories by which Stanovich tries to put in the different ways that we go astray. The cognitive minds refers to the fact that we often go astray because we uh, defer as a default to the immediate uh, answer that comes to us through our autonomous mind, as it's known. Uh, the autonomous mind is the one that uh, is automatic. It's the system one, they call it, of our thinking. It's what Kahneman calls fast thinking. And by the way, Kahneman's book has just come out again as a paperback on fast and slow thinking, and if you don't have it, it's a chance to get it. It's also a good book to read. Uh, and um, so several psychologists like Kahneman and so on, many psych cognitive psychologists have their version of a two-tier system. There's this automatic system, and then we have this slower, more cognitively consuming system, uh, which is later in evolution, and one we don't share with the rest of the animal world. We share the first system with the rest of the animal world, and it's one that uh, enables us to do logic and to be scientific and stuff, but it's one that consumes an awful lot of cognitive capacity, and it can only usually do work on one thing at a time, 
and it's very slow, but it can override the automatic system sometimes when it's necessary to, to override it. And it's most valuable when you're dealing with new novel situations. When you're dealing with repetitive situations, sometimes you can trust your automa automatic system. That's what expertise is all about. So anyways, the cognitive bias means that you tend not to want to waste those resources or, or use them when you can get away with something simpler. Kahneman talks about this in terms of attribute substitution. The idea of attribute substitution is that you use a simpler, instead of solving the real problem, you, you, you aim for a, a plausible answer, which is not the real problem, but you're solving a simpler problem, but it can be solved by your automatic mind without too much thinking. And this uh, problem of uh, Jack looking at Ann and Ann looking at George, Jack, you know, is married, and George, you know, is unmarried, but you don't know anything about whether Anne is married or unmarried. And so there's some, some uncertainty about there. So at this point, your automatic mind tells you it's undetermined, undecided, because you don't know anything about Anne, whether she's married or not. And you leave it at that. That's what a cognitive mind would do. But um, if you uh, stopped and really wanted to really attend to this very carefully, if you thought about it, you could do what's called disjunctive thinking. What if Anne were married, okay? So then, okay, Jack is married. He's looking at Anne, who's married. But Anne is now looking at George, who's not married. So, so in fact, at least if she were married, an unmarried person is look, a married per, unmarried person is looking at an unmarried person. Do I have that right? No, no, I got it wrong. Okay, uh, okay, so, if, but if Anne were, now you, now you go back, and this is what's called disjunctive thinking. It takes a lot of work to do this. If Anne is unmarried, then automatically an unmarried person is looking at a, I'm sorry, was it George that was married? Mm -hmm. Should be, okay. It's looking at George who was married. So either way, it, it, but it's not always Anne. It's some, uh, an unmarried person is looking at a married person. Whether, whether she, she's married or not. So it really, ultimately, it doesn't make any difference whether she's married or not, because either way, an unmarried person, not necessarily Anne all the time, uh, is looking at an unmarried person. But you see how this is difficult for us to think about, but we have to use our cognitive resources, and it's very difficult. So the cognitive miser ordinarily defaults to the simplest answer, which is, and by the way, it turns out when you give them these three alternative uh, answers, uh, where did I put that? Um, yeah, okay. When you, if I don't put these down, actually more people are going to solve it. Because you, you didn't automatically have it. But I put these down, you immediately, this primes the uh, automatic answer. And it saves you from having to waste your precious cognitive resources so you can go for it. And once you go for it, you're hooked. Okay. So that's the idea of the cognitive miser. And he's, he's going to explain a lot, half, a lot of the problems that we get into is because of the cognitive mind. We, we don't uh, fully do that. Another, another example of, to illustrate the cognitive miser approach was the um, bat and ball. Let me put it that way. Those of you who weren't here, this is a favorite of, of Kahn, uh, Kahn, Danny Kahneman. He likes to use that for his purposes, his best slow, slow thinking. But it's an old problem. A bat and a ball cost $1.10. To, in total, the bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, now, those of you who weren't here, those of you who are here know, but those of you who weren't here, your automatic system automatic, is going to feel like saying 10, right? You want to say 10 dollars. And that's fine until you are, if you let your other system kick in, you think about it, and you think about the answer very closely, if it was ten dollars, if the ball cost ten dollars, how much more would the bat cost? What's that? No, no. If the if the if the ball cost ten dollars, how much more would the? Dollars and cents. It's a different example from yesterday. Was it a different one? Yeah. This is common. 
Oh, hundred dollars. Okay, I'm sorry. This is this is a dollar. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's the same principle. Okay. Yeah, no, I just want to Thank you. Uh, I've just been corrected by uh, my uh, uh, official corrector. <laughs> okay, it's we need. That's why we need an audience. <laughs> you people are the proxy for all the people who are going to watch this online. Um, okay, so one half of the picture is the cognitive miser. The other half of the picture is what he calls mindware problems. Mindware is, is knowledge. That would be the parallel with the uh, crystallized knowledge as opposed to intelligence as opposed to the fluid knowledge, which is this is closer to that intelligence. Okay, so mindware problems have to do with two things, two kinds of mindware problems. What's called mindware gaps. You just lack the necessary information you need. And this is a lot of the problems in probability that we have uh, and in dealing with scientific data and so that we just don't have the training or the background to have it. We don't have that in our, we don't have that knowledge, we haven't been trained at it. Uh, but then there's another kind of uh, insidious kind of mindware uh, problem, and that's what's called contaminated mindware. We do have information, but it's contaminated, it's wrong mind. We're, we're going to come across that a bit later when we get into, what, into what's called the Matthew effect. Uh, and it shows that we always come to problems, every problem, we can't, come, we can't do otherwise, already with background pre preconceptions and information. And if that information is bad or wrong, we're going to come out, come out bad very badly. That's why it's important to stuff your mind with good stuff rather than bad stuff. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so I hope you get the, the so I just want to make sure you've got that distinction and I, right and we get, we get it right because I, I skipped it over too much. We, we went into the problems, but I didn't pay much, too much attention to that. Now, I've got a couple of other problems I want to give you. Um, and I wrote it down just by hand. So this is unusual. This is handmade, this one. I just made this up right now. I just wrote it down by hand. And it's very r rare to get anything that's homemade now. Every, because we have PowerPoint and all this other stuff. So this is very valuable stuff. In fact, we're going to auction it off after the course. OK. This is the lily pad one. Uh, I didn't have a, I thought I had some printed out on it, but that's OK. I, I wrote this out just now. But the, the lily pad problem is a lily pad grows so that it doubles on each day. It doubles in area, doubles in size, OK? So there's a pond, and there's a little pad on the air, and each day it grows, it just doubles in size, okay? And it keeps doing that till it completely covers the pond. You get that picture? In one of these ponds you don't want to jump into anymore. Okay, so on what day of its life, oh, let's say on the 20th day of its life, it completely covers the pond, okay? So on the 20th day, the pond becomes completely covered. So the question is, was the pond half on what day of its life was the pond half covered? And I'll give you some alternatives like, was it the fifth day, the 10th day, the 15th day, or none of the above? Okay, and you can think and so on. I hope you think. <laughs> uh, so how many people would go for uh, none of the above? Well, about half of you. So you see, I just got some, so someone's from, anyone for the fifth day? No? The tenth day? Okay, we got one at the tenth day. Fifteenth <laughs> day? Okay, we got some fifteenth day. Okay, so we got a few who got the others, and some are too embarrassed to put their hands up while they're, uh, it's too difficult. That you're using, you're, you're not on cognitive misers, you're uh, arm misers or energy misers. <laughs> okay. Uh, the point is of this one is that uh, the pond will be uh, half covered the, the very next to the last day, on the 19th day. If you think about it, because if it's half covered on the 19th day, it, it doubles in size. The next day, on the 20th day, it's going to be fully covered. Do, do you get that? This is a point where sometimes it's often useful to work backwards. And again, uh, having a, you, you, your automatic system is not going to do that for you. All right, now let me give you another example here. I wrote this down here. I, I'm not sure any people want to value it so I can, I can destroy this so I can 
fold it. Say this is a standard piece of paper from, um, you know, you get these papers in reams of 500. And this is, uh, let's say, I think I once calculated it out about, that doesn't make any difference too much, but let's say it's about zero, zero, I think it's point zero, zero, four inches. Now, how did I measure that? Anyone have any idea? Yeah. Folded numerous times. No, how, how do I know it's zero, zero, four? Oh, you said I fold it in order to get the measure. Right, if I wanted to. Oh, I see what you did. That's a good idea. I never thought of that way doing it. <laughs> That's pretty close. I did something close. What I did is I took the, the ream of paper, uh, 500 sheets. I measured it. That's easy to measure. And then I divided by the 500. Right. Okay. So it was. So. much better. You don't have to fold it. Right. Fold it completely there. Okay. But say, say it's some, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I can fold this and double it. That doubles the thickness now, right? So you can imagine, you can see how thick it is with, when I just doubled it. I can do it again, and you can imagine how thick it is. It's, okay, I can do it again. It prints out, by the way, you can't do it more than six or seven times. There's a big fight about that. In fact, some, go on the web, it's interesting, Ch check it out. Some, that was some time ago, I remember. Some girl in England, as a project, she worked the work out, she got, she slimmed the paper out, she took it, stretched it out, and she broke the, she got the world's record how many times you can fold it. Still, it's not a great number. Uh, but it used to be six or seven was the maximum you could fold a piece of paper. So in fact, because of the uh, Avogadro's number and other problems, you can't fold it too many times, an actual fit. But imagine, because well, that's what, another thing, we got imaginations. Imagine that we could keep continue folding it. And we continued folding it until I have folded it 50 times. That, you know, I doubled it, I doubled it again, I doubled it again, I doubled it again, I doubled it again, 50 times. Sit back, relax, and imagine how tall, how thick this final bundle will be. And uh, is anyone willing to make a guess on the basis of their intuition, not, not, not their science, but their intuition? Because I just wanted to, uh, he, okay, he, he, knows the, he knows the formula for doing that. But someone want to make a guess about their, uh, in terms of how they're into, what does your, into, your intuition tell you? This would be your, no, your first your system one. What would it tell you that after I done, kept folding it until I got, did it 50 times, how tall would that be? How thick would it be? Anyone make a guess? See, you're, you're, you're too embarrassed to, 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 you don't have the confidence in yourself to. to well, the regular piece of paper 50 times? Yeah. That's it. Right. It's just as thick as that 500 paper ring you started with. Right? Just by yeah. this paper ring, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, you're, you're sure, but this is, if your intuition, uh, and this is a JPL uh, sci engineer, okay, she, we, she's going to do it scientifically. <laughs> oh, six times two is 50. I know it'll cover Yeah, now most people don't know it, <laughs> no, don't even have any feel for that. Big numbers, but it's pretty big. Uh, but but what intuitively, how would you say how big would that be? <laughs> no, 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 don't no, don't do your science. Do it into it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so she knows how to think that way. Most of us don't. Ninety-nine point nine percent. I've figured that out. Don't know. Yeah, so how big would it be? How how? Yeah, but a real, real thing in terms of would it be as tall as the hotel or some, how tall would it be? Now, what's your intuition? Don't, don't write, what's, what's that? Big. Big, how big? Okay. Well, don't, the intuition's got to be fast, the fast thing. We don't want to slow thinking, okay? That's the idea. Okay. Okay, he's got this big, okay. Uh, uh, okay, you ready? You ready for the answer? Yes. Okay, the answer is uh, it would be 79 plus million, million miles, 79 million miles, about three quarters of the way from here to the sun. Okay, uh, so uh, that, you see how counterintuitive that is. We don't have a way of thinking naturally. It's not part of our natural way of thinking to think in terms of exponential growth, linear growth. What is going on here, one aspect of this is called the anchoring illusion, uh, the anchoring heuristic. 
what you're doing in your own mind is, as I keep folding it each time, the first several folds are very, very small. And you don't realize that the, uh, exponential growth is huge. So let me show you something here. Oh, I did have it up. Okay, so you should see, okay. But, but you look at here, um, this is one way, of, this is smooth, this is continuous. It, actually, it's, it's discontinuous, uh, but it's easier to make. So I, this is an equation I use. But okay, so you look uh, through most of the, of the folding, you see we're very close to the baseline here. But right at the end, this is the way exponential growth goes, it is in a big explosion, looks like, right to the, up to the top there. And um, it's like the lily pad thing, too. If we look at this backwards, we can see better. I said it was 79 million miles, right? Over 50% of that is done in the last fold. Uh, and if you look at that, so the last fold is, and here, here I'll do it this way, I'll show you on this thing here. I took, took the percent of the total distance. This is 100, if you take 100% of the 79 million miles, right? The last fold covers half of that, it's about, which is a huge number, right? But it's taken up with the very last fold. Then you go down here, the very last is huge. Dollars is huge, but very quickly you get down to very little. And by the time we get down to uh, even at 30, but we can't show it on this graph because the very fir first 30 or so are so small. But this is the, this is the feature of exponential growth. Uh, and uh, it, it comes up in science a lot. We keep hitting it in many ways, but people have no no, no intuitions about it. And uh, so it's very important. And, and it's, this is another striking example of uh, the limitations of our minds. And uh, of our mind, this is why the mind wear gap, by the way. It's because we weren't trained to think that way. We weren't trained, and in fact, um, if there's a wonderful book, by the way, uh, by Brockman, he puts out these books. And this one, the book is called, this recent one, it's called, This Will Make You Smarter. And, and everyone is, you've got the most important people in the world almost, the most smartest people in the world. I think there may be over 100 people. They're, only, they're allowed only to write a page or two at most of what they think is a very important concept that could make us smarter. And one of the people who writes there, he says, getting a notion of, um, uh, of ex thinking in terms of, ex uh, of um, uh, of exponential growth and, and that kind of thing, and, and, and thinking in terms of to powers, numbers to the certain powers, and getting a feeling for that, right? so you could understand the Richter scale. For example, if you go, if an if a, uh, earthquake goes from uh, six to seven on a Richter scale, it doesn't sound like much, but it's huge because, because it's an exponential type of thing. And, uh, okay, so given all that, I want to now, I think, uh, deal with, uh, get into, um, all right, I don't want, want some blank paper. This, here we are. I want to now get you ready for the next lecture, uh, which is gonna be introducing finally a framework for helping you use your resources wisely as a framework. Not necessarily the framework, almost any framework I think could be helpful. So, but I'm gonna teach you a framework that which you will use for the rest of this course to evaluate uh, claims, dubious claims, okay? And uh, I'm gonna base it on, I'm gonna, we're gonna use what's called hypothetical thinking, okay? Again, I'm doing this by hand. This is uh, lower just a little on the table there, right? Okay. I even can spell it correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking. There's a couple of good books uh, by a psychologist named Evans, Jonathan, I mentioned him in the previous lecture. Jonathan Sebastian. He's got a few other names, too. These British love to fill in a lot of names. Uh, he's got a T, some other names, Evans, ultimately. I guess if I had a name like Evans, I'd want to put some other 
distinguishes in here as well. But anyways, he has been for many years, many, many years, he has been uh, studying a British psychologist who studies uh, thinking, rational thinking and, and logical thinking. And he's done a lot of it. So he has one of his books is called, and one book he's called is, is simply called If, which is a form you know, of hypothetical thinking, is if-then type of thinking. Uh, and then he has another book called, called Hypothetical Thinking. And it both gets, deals with the logic of hypothetical thinking, but mostly it's dealing with the psychology of it as well. Um, so hypothetical thinking, and that's what I'm going to introduce you to, because I'm going to use that as the basis of my framework that we'll introduce in the next lecture. Uh, it's if-then type of thinking. And much, almost everything you do in science and stuff, it can always be fit into that kind of a framework. So if, and usually the thumb that, that's, that comes after the if is called an antecedent. That's the antecedent. If the antecedent is true, then something should follow, and that's called the consequence of the antecedent. So that's the basic, simple framework. It's going to be complicated, obviously, as you can imagine. But let's talk for a while just with that framework. Uh, how many of you have heard of Venn diagrams? Okay. They are attempts, some people, to visualize logical statements and stuff like that. And in this case, we're going to say, okay, if A, then C. How would we diagram that? We could diagram it this way. A, that's everything that's an A is in this circle there. And everything that's the consequence is in that big circle. So what that says is that everything that's A is also contained within a set of things that are C. Now, let's look at a couple of possibilities here. We can have A can be true. We can say A is so, okay? So we if, that's called affirming A. Let's call it that. It's called affirming A. We, we say, okay, A is true. Because this is hypothetical, it says, if A, then C. That doesn't mean that that's so. But now we say, but A is true. What, what, what does that tell us about C? Well, that's affirming uh, the consequent. And affirming the consequent uh, is known as a invalid uh, piece of logic. And why would that be so? Because if we say C exists, C can, something can be C and be, not be A. Can you see that? Because there are other, and that's a bad way. Uh, it could be that all A's are C's, are very close to that. There are only, only very few C, number of C's, but it could be a lot of things that, a lot of reasons why something could uh, be a consequent without A being the, uh, the predecessor of it, or the, uh, the cause of it. Um, and that's called, that's an invalid. We can affirm, what's that? I'm sorry? I don't understand what you mean, Kathy. He's saying if you affirm C. If you affirm The consequence. Oh, you can't do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you affirm the antecedent, that's this thing here, that's called, to get, even give it a Latin name, that's why how prestigious it is, that's a valid, because we say all A's exist are there, and if, if, if something is an A, then since all A's are in C, so the, whenever there's an A, there's gotta be a C. And that's called, it's, it's given even a name, I think it's called modus, modus in case you want interest in Latin, I'm sure you all are. Modus ponens, yeah, that's what it's called. In case you want a Latin name. That's the log logicians have given it that name. There's no good name for this affirming, this is an invalid syllogism, okay? Okay, now we can go, can deny. We start with this general statement, but then we can deny that uh, the antecedent, we can deny that, that A is the case. What would that tell us about, uh, does that, does that uh, require that we also have to deny C? 
You can see that we can get rid of all the A's and there'll still be C's. And so that's an invalid syllogism. Or not a syllogism, a conditional statement, as they call them. These are called conditional statements. We can deny the consequence. What about that? Would that be a valid thing? Would they, if you deny the consequence, would, would it enable us to say that A must also be false, not exist? Yeah. Okay, because if we deny C, C contains A, so we say C isn't there, then A couldn't be possibly there. And this is called a valid syllogism, a, a, deduct, a hypothetical conditional, okay, whatever it is, uh, and it has a name too. It's called modus tollens. Again, you learned it here if you didn't know it before and you got two Latin words you can, two Latin phrases you can speak and enjoy it. All right, now, this is gonna be the basis of our framework. It's in some way the basis of all scientific hypothesis and stuff like that. And now I'm gonna introduce you to someone you may have all well heard of, a, a philosopher of science called Karl Popper. How many have heard of Karl Popper? Okay, a few. Uh, others haven't for some reason, but a few years back, the, Popper was the darling of many scientists, but also he was the worshiped by skeptics. He was, the fact that they had idols or gods, Karl Popper was a god. Uh, and he came up with this notion of falsifiability. And basically he was saying any scientific, anything that pretends to be a scientific theory has to be falsifiable. And he attacked, as good he gave us examples of, of, of pseudoscience, his two big ones was uh, Freudian psychology, because uh, there's no way of falsifying it, and uh, uh, Marxism, no way of falsifying that as well. Those were his two favorites. Problem. I always, I knew Karl Popper, by the way, I only knew a little bit. I was at, uh, when I was writing my book on water witching with my colleague, uh, Vogt, who's an anthropologist, back in 19, published in 1959, so it was back in the 1950s. We wrote it at this institute for research, which is uh, an independent think tank behind Stanford University, and every year they would bring in independent scholars to mix and so on, and Popper was there that year, I was there with, uh, my, my colleague vote while we were writing our book on water witching. Well, anyways, uh, Popper uh, was, he was an Aristotelian in my mind anyways. And Popper, along with many other philosophers, said the only kind of real knowledge is gotta be deductible. Deductive logic is the only kind of logic. What's called inductive logic never can be, you never, you never can ever show that's true. And most scientists, and most philosophers of scientists and not scientists themselves would say the basic approach in science, every time we test hypothesis, is we, we use a conditional statement saying if H, I'm looking to see what my time is, but okay, if H, then P, P being a predicted outcome, okay? We'll use those terms. H is some hypothesis and P. This is the basis of all science, this, this approach. If we, we do an experiment and we test and if P comes out right, we feel that confirms our hypothesis, at least gives us more, doesn't actually say it. Popper pointed out that this is a invalid conditional statement that we just showed you here. Because if you affirm the consequent here, that's invalid. Because there could be a lot of other reasons why. And so Popper uh, was very fearful. This, this was, couldn't be science. He was, he was for science. He was a philosopher of science. And he, but he was also attacking the standing uh, philosophy of science at the time, uh, the positivists. And um, he, uh, so that was how he made his big reputation. He said, this can't be the way science works. But then he said, let's, 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 let's take the, the conditional statement, that, let's take one that is valid. And that one is if, is if, you, if H 
then P, and instead of uh, affirming P, if we can show that P is false, that would show the hypothesis is false. So this we can falsify, use it to falsify, and it's legitimate in his mind because it uses deductive logic, which can be true knowledge. This cannot be true knowledge, it's inductive. And he said there's no way you can show an inductive induction can lead you to knowledge. All science depends on this. All science is inductive. The whole world is inductive. The whole world is based on probability and chance. But even a guy like Popper couldn't accept that. So Popper even convinced some scientists, most scientists realize, we don't behave this way. We don't go out and make hypotheses just to, to, to show that they're wrong. If we're hopefully, we, we, we dance in the streets when we can verify a hypothesis this way, even though it's not certain. And we're going to get into that in the next one. I'm going to show you how scientists handle this situation. But still, scientists recognize that everything is probabilistic. We never have certainty. Everything can be revisable, but we hope we can get there closer and closer. But it's still always going to be probabilistic. If you don't like a probabilistic world, you're going to have to get yourself into some other world. <laughs> uh, everything is inductive. And unfortunately, fortunately, Pop is no longer with us, maybe. Uh, but he, uh, he couldn't. He was a good philosopher. He got knighted for this notion idea. And uh, simple ideas sometimes get very powerful. But even a falsifiability notion is wrong. Even this, in the real world of science, it turns out philosophers show that even this is not true. You, you falsify, falsifications uh, oftentimes turn out to be wrong. Uh, so, so even this is not absolutely certain. But in terms of the logical conditionals, it made him feel good. And he, and he felt this was a big revolution. He was able to suddenly save science. And he was able to tell scientists, that's what you do. And scientists were scratching their heads. Some of them, some said, hey, that's neat. That sounds great. The philosophy's shown that we now use valid deductive rules and we get that valid deductive knowledge. But he also, you know, he was aware that most of science, 99% of the time, is, is getting successes with their predictions. And each time they get a success, they increase their uh, believe, to them increases their probability of believability of the truth of this. But in Popper's mind, in his theory, in his book, the whole, his whole approach, there cannot be any inductive knowledge. He finally had to give in a little bit and said, well, there is a notion of corroboration. It, a, a successful outcome like that corroborates, but doesn't add anything. And corroboration doesn't mean much at all. And, but corroboration was really secretly sliding in the other side, the fact that scientists do feel more confident about their theories when they predict right. So you get, so even a man like Popper can be wrong, okay? Uh, even wrong using, I'm sure Popper used system two thinking a lot. But, um, so, but we're going to, uh, so now you know all about conditional statements. You know all about, yes, I, I, I am aware that uh, I'm about to finish. I'm going to wind up now a little bit early. And next time, we're going to use this uh, conditional thinking for our framework. And because it is the framework that science uses as well. We're going to have to complicate it a little bit because a man named Duhem and then others eventually found the re reality was that uh, this is a little too simplified. So even if you uh, falsify this, and that's one of the reasons why falsification alone is not good enough, is because you may not be falsifying a hypothesis. You may be find you may be find this may, may be false because you, there are other conditions that that weren't fulfilled, and they're what we call initial conditions and or auxiliary conditions, and we're going to have to put those into the equation. Uh, there are things like when uh, Newton has his laws about um, object falling in space, you know, a, a, a feather and a heavy cannonball falling down. They call, they, they land uh, about the same time only if you assume it's in a vacuum. If it's not in a vacuum, you have the uh, atmosphere and other stuff retards the, the uh, feather more than the ball, and so that in the real world, the balls hit the ground faster. But 
In the Newtonian system, they don't. Because you have to have, but only if you uh, make the assumption that it's in a vacuum. And, we, and that's just one example. And we'll come to that next time.